So I want to set up the theme for our discussion. I figured I may as well dive headfirst into the deep end and, and let's get into the, the big questions. So we're going to try and focus on the future. Uh, as, as important as the history is, as, as you know and I know, uh, it can't be ignored, but the way forward is, is the way forward. We, we, we need to start looking to the future. So the biggest question I think that comes up most of the time when, when you start talking about a peace agreement is one state or two states. That's, I mean, it's not necessarily as black and white as that, but when you start talking about solutions, those are the two that come up. Uh, for any listeners who are aware of the situation, uh, they already know two states is, is basically off the table, if not nearly impossible. Um, however, as you and I and many other people know as well, one state poses its own challenges and, and difficulties as well. So what is your opinion on the one state versus two state debate? And then maybe uh, when you're talking about each of those, uh, maybe mention what, what some of the challenges are to both of those. Yeah. Um, okay. So I think I'd like to start first. So you said that the, the listeners probably know that the two state solution is off, um, is kind of off the table. I think it's important to understand that the two state solution is based on segregation. Okay? And I think that when you phrase it like that, because a lot of the times it's like, Oh, you know, just two sides coexisting peacefully. No, no, it's definitely, it's built um, the also accords were built on this theme of segregation and sort of peace for or land for peace. And I am very, very much opposed to that. Right. I don't think that we as Palestinians should accept 22 percent of our own historic homeland. I find that ridiculous. Right. And I think as well, uh, one of the reasons why the Palestinians accepted to it is because we were defeated and there was no other choice. And the PA or uh, Yasser Arafat and his whole crew wanted to kind of maintain that power that was kind of getting taken away from them after the first Intifada. And so the two-state solution now uh, mainly has been kind of dealt its death blows by just the amount of Israeli settlements that have been built in the past 20 years, right? We've been, and, and you see, if, if you look at a map of Trump's new peace plan or whatever, you see that this, this really looks like South Africa, South African apartheid. And there's yeah. a lot of Israelis that, you know, don't like the comparison and whatnot. But if you just look objectively at the map and you look at these little enclaves uh, that are supposed to be Palestinian territories, it just doesn't make any sense. Right. So our vision. So me as a Palestinian, uh, as a young Palestinian, uh, I don't claim to speak on behalf of anyone. However, the young Palestinian generation, the more the, the our, my generation, it's been shown in polls that we are much more supportive of, a, of, of one state that is based on equal rights for all. And I think that um, this vision of, you know, one country that is based on equality and not based on segregation um, has a lot more substance to it. And it can garner a lot more, uh, a lot more kind of hope and, and, and drive and it can create that sort of national movement that, for example, anti-colonialist uh, movements in the 60s and 70s garnered, right? Mm -hmm. I think that when we, when we strive for equality, as it's been shown in the Black Lives Matter protests, in, uh, I mean, just uh, equality is what we need, right? So we talk about peace. I think that peace comes as a result. Peace is, peace is something that comes uh, after equality. Because Palestinians have been dehumanized for so long and we have never been afforded the right to self-determination as much as people would like to believe that Fatah and the PA and Hamas are representative of us, they are not. Yeah, and we're going to get to that later too. Yeah, and we've always been uh, actively, our leadership has always actively been, you know, s split into different factions. And so we've never really had a voice. And I think that right now, there's this sort of consensus that's kind of brewing up uh, where, you know, we're looking to try and build coalitions. We're looking to uh, talk about our struggle in relation to the Black Lives Matter movement and, and, and bring attention to the, the, the dire situation that Palestinians within the West Bank and Gaza and Palestinian citizens of Israel find themselves in. Because a lot of people, me living in the States, right, a lot of people are just oblivious to what's going on. And this is a result of Israel's 
um, public relations ministry, or I think it's called the foreign affairs ministry. They, they, they actively, you know, try and portray Israel as this tiny little nation, the size of New Jersey that is, you know, being attacked by everywhere. And so therefore it's, it's normal for them to, and they don't even use the term occupation. Right? No. Which I think to me is, is just crazy. But I do understand. I, I had a debate with an Israeli and Jewish rights activist uh, a couple weeks ago. And he told me that they didn't like to use the term occupation because it implies that they're not native um, to the land. And I mean, I'm not against Jewish self-determination in that land. Right. And that's what the core of Zionism, like Zionism, the belief in the self-determination. But I think that to divorce that from reality, right, and say that there's not an occupation is just so disingenuous. And if it's yeah, not I, occupation, it's martial law applied on a racial basis. 